The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you, Tally Olson. We are back. Comfortably zoned in the vat of pine tar. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Network. My co-host on this show is George Grimm, and the show is devoted to the book that we recently had published. And we are, week to week, we live, we live memories of writing the book, and we have the privilege of bringing people back who were actually in the book and featured in the book. And this week is, hello, George, by the way. How are you doing, uh, Ralph? I'm Good doing quite, quite well. Um, I, want, I want to say that Alan Blumkin, who is featured in an incredibly uh, incredible amount of of the chapters that we did is with us tonight, and he recently got his the book in the mail. And um, your first impression of um, of the book, Alan, and the chapter, the few chapters you only had the book about less than twenty four hours. Not only about but, uh, four hours. Oh, okay. Um, then, but you did you did look over some of uh, oh yeah uh, of what you were involved in, and uh, you some had some nice also. I, I got up. involved with the one with you and Fritz Peterson, and uh, you know a couple of other you know, a few other ones which I wasn't involved in. Okay, which of the ones that uh, you were involved in did you read over just uh, today? Ralph Terry, because the anniversary okay. was the Wednesday of the Mazeroski home run. And, yeah. and you were at that Mazeroski home run. Yeah, it's a long story. I, I, me and the friend snuck in to left field okay. bleachers after the eighth inning. They were 17 and 18 years old. What did we know? <laughs> <laughs> so after Smith hit the home run in the eighth inning, the school was, the dorms were two blocks away. We ran down. I went over to the ballpark. I had an old transistor radio, and we snuck into the left field bleachers, crouched down, and uh, that's we saw the mantle diving back at the first base, and then Mazeroski hit the home run in the second pitch. And uh, I don't know. I always say that that game went went on any longer. We might have gotten arrested. <laughs> um, Alan, I always wanted to ask you about your feelings of fandom during and after that game. You grew up a Yankee fan. You became a Pirate fan when you went to school. No, before that, a couple years before that. uh, uh, And that's the only time I've ever rooted against the Yankees in the World Series. The only time ever, and the only time probably ever, because the Pirates will never make that back back, back there in my lifetime. (laughs) <laughs> and, um, I'm beginning to think the Yankees won't either. Oh, God. Don't get me started on the Yankee team this year. It's... I have a couple of friends who are diehard Yankee fans, and yeah, they just hate the way... You know, I hate the way the game is being played today. Yeah. Hey, would you talk... I, I do, too, but would you talk about Ralph Terry's interview? Um, I know you love that, and... Uh, we did that, I think, with Peter Golenbach. Yes, that was, that was the first time I, uh, uh, the first time that, the uh, first one I looked for was the Ralph Terry, uh, uh, and the Ralph Terry uh, podcast. And, uh, oh yeah, he, you know, he, he was a golfer. I had read his book uh, right down the middle, right before you know, we did the podcast. Right, and uh, so I was familiar with a lot, and I made the comment to him. That I told him, which I think he edited it out. That I liked the book. I said, "You weren't a big fan of general managers, were you?" He started laughing a little bit. <laughs> um, but, no one uh, was basically a big fan the fact of, jo- that, 
uh, yeah, the one thing I was amazed by is I was very reluctant to bring up the Mazeroski game. Right, but you uh, weren't said, reluctant to, at no. all to bring up the game where um, where Bobby Richardson no. caught a line drive no, from no, the but, no, but but he was <laughs> redeemed in that. Yeah, you know, right. He that, came back that was from nice. uh, the horrible loss in 1960 to, to being the, the hero in 1962. So he felt redeemed. So if he had right. come back, you know, come back from that, I would have been a lot more reluctant to ask him about 1960. And Ralph Terry is still going strong. Yeah, he's going to be 86, I, yeah. And he golfs in the wintertime yeah. where he lives in Kansas. And he has nothing um, but nice memories of a career well spent. And like you say, getting redemption is nice. Yeah. Um, um, just in life and in sports and what have you. Maybe because uh, what's, what, what was important to me is that because I already gotten perspectives from the interview I did with Dick Rote in 1985 and talking to Johnny Blanchard before a card show out in Kennedy Airport in 1987. It was still fuming right. at uh, Jim Coates for throwing Cal Smith a fastball. Now, you... Ralph Terry isn't the only one of that uh, genre that you interviewed in your life. You had an extended in, extended interview with Dick Grote. Yeah, that was um, February 1985, yeah. Okay, tell me what that was like, uh, okay. Alan. Okay, I, I, a friend of mine introduced me to him, uh, Pitt Basket, because he used to do the color for Pitt basketball games. So we went out to came in miserable weather to Seton Hall, and he introduced me to him. Mm -hmm. So I asked him if I could you know, talk, do an interview with him when they came at the place St. John's a couple of weeks later. And uh, in between, he was doing a card show in New York. I didn't ask him for an autograph while I met him or an autograph while I did the interview. Uh, I, I bought some stuff at the sign at the card show. Right. And uh, so we set it up. I went out there, took the day off the afternoon off from work. And I went out there. There's a hotel by LaGuardia Airport. And I, I was nervous as hell. <laughs> so we met in the lobby, and he, I started throwing out some of these names because he broke it with the 52 Pirates, who were a terrible team on 42 games. So I, I threw out some names of the players on that team. He said he hadn't heard some of those in 30 years. Wow. So we developed a little bit of a report, and then we went upstairs to his room, and I spent uh, a couple of hours uh, talking to him. I asked, I asked him about the 1960 series, especially that last game, the last couple of innings of the last game. And uh, you know, it was very, very forthcoming about everything and uh, discussed other things. Uh, he said the worst ballpark he ever played in was Colt Stadium in Houston because he never played in the minor leagues. Right. He told me about oh, that wow. place. He says, we, we were lucky. We got out of there after three days. Wow. And uh, about his trade to the Cardinals and he said how much he enjoyed, enjoyed uh, you know, playing for the Cardinals. That he and Joe Brown didn't get Joel Brown, the general manager, had a falling out. I told him when I was I was at Pitt when that trade was announced, I couldn't believe it. And I called up the newspaper and they confirmed it. Well, you know, Branch Rickey played a big part in uh, in Groat's development. Oh yeah, and career. He stopped him from playing basketball. Yeah, what, what um, happened is uh, I discussed that with Groat. Uh, Groat was still referring to him as Mr. Ricky. Right. Even though he'd been dead. Yeah. You know, I think the only one that didn't call him Mr. Ricky was Dizzy Dean. But, what did he uh, call him? Yeah, Groat, Groat said he, he you know, because he played 26 games with uh, the Pistons in 1952-53 before he went into the Army. Average twelve points a game, which this is the days before the twenty-four second clock. 
Uh, yeah, he he was an All American at Duke. At Duke, yeah. And so uh, he said he wanted to play both when he came out of the army. And Ricky said no. He said, uh, you know, he, so Groat said he mentioned Gene Conley. He says, first of all, yeah, that pitch you're going to be playing 150 games for us, and you right. can't, even though the seasons basically was separate at that point. Not, not, they didn't have any overlap the way they do now. That uh, it says, and they're going to want to play you uh, 40 minutes a game. You can't do both. And Gross decided to stay in baseball because uh, as little as he was being paid for baseball that day, that, back then, uh, he was getting paid less for basketball because uh, those days, you know, Bob Cousy and George Michael, the only two players who were really making any money yet. So he stuck with right. baseball, but his first love was always basketball. That's why he took the college job with Pitt. And he just retired, I think, two years ago. He's he's now 90. He'll be 91 in another wow. yeah, month okay. or two. Another guy who's hanging in there. Hey, yeah. I'd like to hear a little bit of George, the great George Grimm's voice on this podcast. So, um George, what do you remember about uh, Ralph Terry's uh, interview? And um, talk a little bit about that, or whatever you'd like to talk about, George. You the man. Uh, probably the uh, the uh, the most impressive thing about the book for me was the one-on-one interviews. I mean, um, you know, Ralph is very good at one-on-one interviews, and. Uh, you, know, you know, all the interviews went very well, and you know, it's it's the kind of thing that, you know, growing up when we were younger, we're all around the same age. I'm only seventy. Um, You're a kid. We didn't get <laughs> those 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 um, in depth interviews. We we got a little sound bites on TV, and uh, you know, we didn't really get get those in depth interviews where people ask questions other than. You know why you throw him this pitch, or you know why about this play, that play. More, more uh, in depth about their life, how they got there, how they came to the major leagues, what they had to go through in the minor leagues. Uh, that that's all very interesting stuff, and that's all in the book in in these these one on one interviews. And I, I think that was one of the most interesting things, you know, for me because I grew up in that era. Uh, I really didn't become a baseball fan until after 1960s, so I really can't uh, refer back to that. But um, I I remember Ralph Terry very well. I remember all those Yankees that you mentioned, Johnny Blanchard, all those guys. I remember Johnny Blanchard used to hit a lot of pinch hit home runs, and um, I I loved those Yankees in those days. And I and you know Ralph was able to interview uh, Al Downing. And Fritz Peterson and a lot of Mets from those from those days and um, those one-on-one interviews are really special to me and I think that's that's one of the highlights of the book. Yeah, one of the things I'm most proud of because I reread that today for the first time and is the Ar- the Irv Noren interview. Yes. Oh yes. Because yeah, I basically yes. handle that because you know he's one of the players who were the baseball cards I grew up with. And uh, even though he wasn't one of my favorites when he was with the Yankees, you know, I managed to uh, couch everything, and I got very good responses from him. Yes, that was terrific. And you know what's um, very sad about writing the book and the aftermath? People that I interviewed, Bob Wolf, for instance, Irv Noren as an example, have passed away. Right. And, um, boy, when that happens periodically, um, it just shuts me down because, um, first of all, I'm so delighted to have had their the pleasure of their company when they were alive, but I would have liked them to return and keep returning so that if there's anything we didn't cover, uh, you know, but uh, we get that covered. But that's mortality, and that's all part of this. And um, 
that's why our look backs are so important, keeping the, the moments alive. And um, I'll give you an example of how everybody can get something out of this book. Jerry Feidelberg just completed it. He's um, comfortably his own regular, and he too is featured in the book. He's 82 years old and an avid sports fan. He knows, knows it all. And his remark after reading the book, he sent me a little um, thing. He's still recuperating from, from back surgery. He said he, he cited two or three things that he he always knew. He said, I always knew these things. I can't remember what they were. But I didn't know this and that happened around exactly. around it. Yeah, yeah, a lot of right. details. Yeah, a lot of details. Was that not a, a compliment to both of us, George? Right, right, yeah. A lot of details uh, in the book. Things that, things that, you know, you knew of them, but you didn't know why, you didn't know how they came about, and there's a lot of details in the book that, uh, that will uh, surprise people. Now, one of the ones I enjoyed very much was the Maya Pell one. Oh. I, I hardly remember that, but I did ask him some pretty good questions about, you know, the poor players I grew up with in the 50s, and he had answers on all of them. Yeah. I yeah. would like to say, Alan, that we painted you in a good light, but you painted the light yourself. All we did was identify it. You know, you know what I mean? We picked the questions that not just because they were good, they were all good, Alan. You, Thank you. You have a skill, and your voice will forever, uh, um, uh, his name, the pit guy, who, uh, the pit announcer, who you sound so much like. We've talked, Bino Cook. Oh, my God. I know him very well, yeah. Uh, give me a Bino Cook. This wasn't in the book or anything, and I digress, George, so I apologize okay. to you. Uh, but uh, give me a Bino Cook story of any kind, and I'll be delighted to hear it. He was so charming and so knowledgeable, and um, I, ju I just love to hear one. Well, he loved all, you know, because when I went to Pitt, for the first time, they start taking in, you know, people from the, this part of the world here. And, uh, right. you know, we used to go to all the basketball games. Nobody was going to the basketball games in those years, in the, in the first couple of years. And uh, he used to tell, tell me how much he enjoyed being with the New Yorkers. He says, you guys are all crazy. I said, we're <laughs> crazy. I said, what about you? And he, uh, I could tell a couple of stories that, uh, but None of them would be uh, fit <laughs> for this. Okay, he was a, just he was, tell, he was, he was, just he was tell me that you enjoyed his, his company. Oh, yeah. And that's, oh, oh, yeah. Good. He was a character. He was really a character. Um, as are you, Alan. You have a, a, a certain way of uh, presenting that New York flavor that is so hard because New York has changed and yeah. you stayed, you stayed and you, um, you, you're a throwback. So yeah, well, it's um, funny because, uh, I've become pretty good friends with Pam Henderson. Right. As, and as she, have I. Yeah. And she loves, she, she's told me this a few times uh, by a uh, messenger on Facebook that she loves my accent. <laughs> <laughs> and I, um, I, I said, accent, you know, this is the way I grew up. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that, um, that I had an accent until I went into the Air Force. Uh, uh, I thought everybody spoke this way. Dems and Bs. Well, um, well, well yeah. I found out in Pittsburgh when I went there for the first time. Mm -hmm. I ordered oh, yeah. a soda, and they gave me an ice cream soda. I said, I, I, I'm at the Coke or Pepsi or whatever. 
I said, no, that's not a, that's not a soda here. That's a that's pop. Yeah, pop. Right. Yeah, because right. I thought uh, the the only uh, you know the only three accents in the country were Boston, New York, and the South. But right. Pittsburgh Pittsburgh is more Midwestern than it is Eastern. Yeah, it, the yeah um, um, with the book, um, um, uh, the uh, you know the accents were um, a little hard sometimes to understand. But anytime Ralph would say the word New York, I would always spell it Y A W K, New York. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> and uh, it got past the editor. It got past uh, David Hubble. I guess he knew what I was doing. And uh, so at any time you see Ralph saying New York, it's going to be spelled New York. No, that's, well, that's, yeah, well, yeah, what's I, years and years ago, I read the Rocky Graziano autobiography somewhere that likes me. Yeah. And mm-hmm. when he went into the army, which he eventually got thrown out of, he said he ran into trouble by pronouncing New York, you know, N-O-O-W-Y-A-Y-K. And for the life of me, I was like 15 years old when I read this. Uh, now, I had no idea what was so funny until right. I went out to Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> I I used to do a little thing in my act about the accents and dialects and what have you. And um, it was about aging when I did this. is when I did comedy, believe it or not. Oh, wow. And... Um, it, it was about aging, and I, I said, you know, I'm 40 years old. I was back then, and um, I, I just, people say, how you feeling? And I go, well, I'm getting along, but I'm getting a little accent as yeah. I get older. Because when I was a kid, I thought that older people got their accents because they got older. I didn't realize that it all the old people in my family, they all had that little accent. So I thought, well, he's over 40 now. He's getting a little up there. You, you no, no, nobody speaks Yiddish anymore. No. Uh, um, or English, for that matter. I know. If you stop, if you stop to think about it. Um, hey, guys, what a terrific show. Thank you. Um, One thing I want to add, uh, I know George is a big on hockey. Uh, so yeah. I, used to, I used to follow that, uh, I guess, uh, you know, when it was six teams, I knew everybody. I used to have their cards. Exactly, exactly. And th- then at 12, I could handle And I think once, what, what happened to me is that I was watching an Islander when they were clinching at one of the Stanley Cups. They're playing the Flyers. And... Uh, the Islanders were ahead by five goals, I think, at the point near the end of the game, last, what turned out to be a last game. And the uh, Flyers had a thug named Wilson, I think his name was. Yeah. That and started the started the Pier 6 right at the end of the game. And I said, right. this, this, you know, I don't like gratuitous, uh, gratuitous fighting. And when right. they well, play that, the Olympics, there's no fighting. Team. and this is a pure sport. So it's, it's, very good. it's a very nice sport when it's pure. Right. Well, the thing about hockey is, um, you know, when they had six teams, you know, um, back then I could, I could tell you every play on every team. Oh, now, yeah. now there's okay. 32 teams, and if you ask me to name all 32 teams, I would have to sit down and think about it. I'd, yeah, I'd, I forget. I'd, They're all like that. The baseball went yeah. from 16 to 30. Football went from 12. Or if you throw in the AFL. Uh, you know, the original AFL, 20 to 32. Basketball went from 8 to 30. I mean, it's just, uh, it's become and totally impossible. I, I, I see baseball, certain baseball players, I looked them up and uh, I had never heard of. I looked them up on baseball reference. They couldn't play for, for five years. I don't know yeah. who they are. Yeah. Yeah. And there are hockey teams that played in different leagues that ended up either merging or being eliminated. So, oh, yeah. well, they brought in from the WHA, right. and the NBA brought in the, for, from the old ABA. ABA, right. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, the uh, Oakland Seals 
were part of the, the first expansion from six to 12 teams, and they moved to um, Cleveland. Minnesota, and then Minnesota they merged, I think. Then, and then they merged with the Minnesota North Stars, and then the Minnesota North Stars moved to Texas, and they were replaced by the Minnesota Wild. It's it's hard to keep track of, you know. No, I think the four teams that came from the WHA were Edmonton, uh, Quebec, which is now the Colorado Avalanche, right? Winnipeg, the first Winnipeg, which I think that was the Phoenix Coyotes, and the fourth yeah. one was the Hartford Whalers. Right, right. Ooh, and they're now in Carolina, Carolina. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you, you have to you have to keep track. It's it's not easy to keep track. You need a spreadsheet sometimes. I know that, yeah. It, it, it's and the, the four in the ABA were Denver, Indiana, San Antonio, and the Nets who have been all over the place. It's, they finally found a home in Brooklyn last year. Yeah, okay. and a nice one. But then craziness sets in on a team that may, may just be jinxed. Great point guard. They were on their way to the championship. And the guy won't get COVID. He won't get COVID shots. He's, yeah, only, he's, he's crazy. Kyrie I, Irving I, is crazy, yeah. Uh, it's It amazes me, not just him not getting COVID shots, but people all over this country are not following science and mixing politics in. Oh, it's not going to go that. You know, we can go on yeah. forever with that. Uh, no. uh, and uh, the bet and the hockey commissioner uh, said there are only four players. As of last week, there are only four players in the league who were unvaccinated. Okay. Which is pretty impressive. Yeah, but no still, question. you should have it in their contract that they have to because yeah. Yeah, you know, you know, you're gonna, you know, hockey's a contact sport. You, you know, you 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 bleed on people, you you sweat on people, you come in close contact with people. You have to take protection. And uh, I I don't understand why uh, why anyone's not getting a shot. I and uh, you know, I've come to the conclusion that it's one of those things that you know we'll never understand because we don't get it. We don't understand why people don't do it, and we're just, you know, never going to get it. No one's ever going to explain it to us that we can understand it. So, you well, just gotta. Well, uh, Trump and the, the rest of his isolates have done yeah. more damage to this country in more ways yeah. than will ever be repaired in a lifetime. Yeah, not, not in our lifetime. No, for sure, and it may not be done. And where is the New York courts that are supposed to be convicted? at least trying this guy on his taxes. And yeah, well, the yeah these, these, Georgia, things, these, these things take a, uh, take a lot of time. I know. they. All, it's already taken a lot of time. <laughs> so yeah. uh, well, let's, let's get it get speeded into this up. Because it's, it's sickening. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, let's end on a high note. Thank you, Alan, for blessing us. Thank Both you for you having folks. me, and uh, thank you, George, I, I mean, for helping not, Ralph out with this. Um, helping Ralph out. <laughs> that, it wasn't just helping Ralph out. Uh, he wrote George, it. George, picked, we wrote the, it you together. You from the podcast? No, okay. we read it. I interviewed the people. We read yeah. it. Yeah. We wrote it. Um, we, uh, we never, in all the time we did this, it's about a year and a half, we never had... We disagreed, but we never had a disagreement. Am I correct? Yeah. No, no. We, we, you know, it, you know, it, it was always one of those things where, you know, we always uh, found uh, common ground. You know, even, even the, uh, you know, the many cover changes, and uh, like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, the name, the number sticks out in my head because uh, when I. Uh, want to get to the cover, I write in my computer, it's the 28th. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, for one reason or another, uh, and to say nothing of the names, we were going to, we were going to yeah. go uh, take it in a totally different direction. And um, George is steady, Eddie, all the way. Um, no, ever so, yeah, ever since Glory came out, and then compounded by uh, uh, Boys of Summer and uh, Piers 
book on the old Yankees, uh, your dynasty, right. I've, been, I've become a sucker for old history. Yeah. Yes. Um, and this, this fits in. Um, yeah. it, it transcends podcasting. And uh, the beauty of it, people like you and Hal Bach and George Case III and um, a myriad of people, Peter Trunk, Ronnie Rabinovitz, Wayne Unger, um, and if I'm leaving anybody out, I'll get you in eventually, um, are what made the book great. Your insights interviewing each other. I enjoyed so much when you uh, podcast where George would interview Alan. George might interview David Hubler. And uh, the way um, I meant George Case, but the way George Grimm put it all together and um, me really, really did a great job. Do you want to hear a little story about Peter Trunk? Sure. Okay. He runs uh, runs a couple of uh, pages on Facebook. One of them, he posts old pictures of New York City. Mm-hmm. Going back to the ferry. So uh, one day, about a month or two ago, he puts up a picture of Gloria Swanson walking on some Manhattan Street. Well, I remember. So, 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 so I, 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 I put down on the you know the comment I made on this. Thanks, Peter. She looks like she's getting ready for a close-up <laughs> from Sunset <laughs> Boulevard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he's he's great at that stuff. He's also a huge Brooklyn Dodger fan, and even though I hated them when they were in Brooklyn, I, I, I've come to peace with it. Me too. As a Giant fan, I yeah. uh, except yesterday, <laughs> it, that it was a tough game for me to handle. Oh yeah, um, because I still I still am a Giant apologist, although I'm a Met, a Met fanatic. Um, I, I still have a hard time with the two teams not being one team. New York Giants, San Francisco, they really are one team. I know, um, yeah. So, and Brooklyn, and like I say, the memories of Campy and Junior Gilliam um, and players like that transcend my hatred for the Dodgers in the old days. It's now become a love. Um, same I'm with the Duke's, Yankees. I'm at a Duke side of Frank Club. Well, I'm not. And if, and, and, if anybody would have told me 20 years ago that I'd be in something <laughs> like that, I would have said they were crazy. But things yeah, evolved. Uh, exactly. The only, th- the only thing that's devolved is the is sport that's devolved is baseball. Uh, and we covered that in yeah, uh, a beautiful yeah. interview it, yeah. towards the back of the book. Uh, George Case is in that one. How about you are in that one? And I think and David, David Hubla. And no four people tell it better about their feelings as fans of how baseball is yeah. simply letting them down, letting all of you down, all of us down, and um, it's not the same game. No, it's and, not. By a long stretch, it's not the same game. They're about to put one of the final nails in, in the coffin. I think that the DH will be uh, put into the National League. Oh, it will, definitely, because the CBA is up after the you know, after the World Series. The right. The bargaining agreement, and, you know, the, the, there's more jobs for the players' union. But the way, with the analytics and the, uh, you know, the, 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 and somebody put that, I put up a post on one site that uh, the American League had no pitches this year with 200 innings. And uh, the uh, Garrett Cole had uh, the American League and wins with 16. And somebody says, well, the game has evolved, and blah, 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 one of these you know, our kids. I said, the game hasn't evolved, it's devolved. Very good expression. It's, be- it's yeah. become boring. Yeah. Okay. Well, the one thing you'll never hear, Alan Blumkin has become boring. 
Yeah. Guarantee Thank you. you that. Thank you for all Thank your you, contribution. George. Thank you, George, for your okay, being. One thing I'd like to add, if I can, if anybody wants to read a story about how uh, how Ralph uh, became the podcast man, you can go to Seniors Lifestyle Magazine, and you can you can uh, Google Ralph Zig Tycho Podcast Man, and you'll see uh, a, an article, a pretty lengthy article, with a um, blurb about the book at the end that uh, we wrote and we had put in on that website, which has drawn a lot of attention. So oh, yeah. It is, and there's a link to, to it um, in the article. There's a link to Amazon and where you may pick up the book. And yeah, I saw it on listening, Amazon, yeah. I saw it on the Amazon page, yeah. Good. Um, anybody who has an interest in pleasing a fanatical baseball fan in your life. It's the holiday season, and no better time to show your gratitude uh, or whatever you love. Or... Makes a great gift. How about that? Okay, and... Ralph, one last question before we go. Is there sure. going is, is to be a, a podcast with George and Hal and David on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday? There is not. This coming Tuesday. Because what about the monthly thing? It is postponed this month because this is the first month of um, the release of the book, and um, we're taking up a lot of air time with that. But but we will have one next month for sure. Okay. All right. I apologize to Hal. Uh, because um, of what happened this, you know, this afternoon. This I, communication, it happens all the time. I tell people, thank God I'm not Walter Cronkite. Yeah. And this is <laughs> it. We're very flexible here. Okay. And um, thank you for being here. Thank you for, uh, again, thank you for your being George Grimm, the great George Grimm. And um, I'm Ralph Tycho, Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. We will continue doing this. Uh, for the unbelievable future. Yeah, uh, well into it. We're going to do this uh, on a very regular basis. If, if, you, so, if, you, need, if you need me, uh, if you're doing another book uh, you know, podcast, let me know. Okay. Beautiful. Thank okay. you so much, Alan. Um, talk soon. It's okay. Uh, comfortable. Say hi, hi to Howie. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. The proceeding has been a Comfortably Zoned Network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.